Okay, so good evening, everybody. Um, this is a talk called Don't Stop the Rot. It's about deadwood invertebrates and their conservation. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, it's one of my, two of my favorite subjects, which is insects and big old trees. I really do love big old trees. Okay, a little bit about me. So I'm based in Warwickshire. I'm a freelance ecologist now, uh, specializing in invertebrate conservation especially pollinators, but I do love trees as well. And uh, I'm not an arboriculturalist, but I do a lot of tree walks and I've done a lot of tree publications. I'm very interested in trees, you know, as, as a naturalist really, more than a tree surgeon. I'm an amateur entomologist since childhood. I've surveyed many sites all over the UK. I was a, I was a local government ecologist for Coventry and I've worked for the Nature Conservancy Council, two museum services, which is Coventry and Warwick, Warwickshire Wildlife Trust and Bug Life. And I've written lots of things, uh, books, guidance sheets, lots of web things. I, I like I like putting stuff out there in as many formats as possible for as many audiences as possible. And those are some examples of some of the things I've published and written. OK, so um, again, I've, I've got little bits of dialogue. So I can't quite see my screen here, so I'm going to have to remember what, what this says. So it's a well time talk this because um, in January of, of of this year, uh, a really a really useful and important report came out by the Woodland Trust, which is, which I wrote for them over the last winter. A review of the pollinators associated with de decaying wood, old trees, tree wounds in Great Britain. And this talk is actually broader than just the pollinators, but it's it's just good that it's sort of time for this, you know, this this quite important publication. And you can get this online from my ResearchGate site. And um, if you want to read up the, the latest information on some of our uh, pollinating saprozylic insects. It's a really good species account, uh, often the most up-to-date that you'll find. So that's something you can get online. If you go to Stephen Fork Research Gate, it's quite easy to pick up all my publications, or you can just put those names into Google and it'll pop up for you. Just Stephen Fork um, pollinators, decaying wood old trees, and you'll, you'll soon find the link. <clears throat> And it's also nicely timed for a for any of you that get British Wildlife magazine. Um, the, le the latest edition has got a summary of that big Woodland Trust report in in an article, about an eight page article. And uh, the editor was lovely. He he allowed me to go quite overboard with photos. So it's it's one of it's a lavishly illustrated um, account of the flower visiting insects associated with old trees and dead wood. So if you don't subscribe try and borrow one. <laughs> it's, it's a very good magazine. I recommend it. It's all naturalists should really subscribe to it. It's that good. Okay. <laughs> I love this slide. Complimentary things to say about a veteran tree. Yeah. And I must admit more and more <laughs> as the years go on, I think most of these adjectives apply to me as well. <laughs> on its way out, I put my back out last week, so I do feel well dodgy. <laughs> <laughs> and needing of needing support, I need all those things. I'm falling apart. So there you go. But it's interesting because um, 30 years ago, maybe 40 years, yeah, nearly 40 years ago, when I worked for the Nature Nature Conservancy Council in Peterborough, there was a Forestry Commission leaflet called um, "Hazardous Signs of Trees," and it was all the things that make um, you know sort of tree surgeons nervous about trees. But of course, for us entomologists, and there were quite a few of us at the old NCC. It was a leaflet that really spelled out all the things that made trees exciting. And of course, one of our battles over the last 30 or 40 years, together with the ancient tree form and, and such like, is to try and get people to appreciate that, a, you know, an old tree is not necessarily a bad tree. And that's, uh, you know, very, very important for biodiversity. So, you know, even though this is quite a funny slide, there's a serious message behind it. OK, so um, some facts about the subject. Dead wood. <laughs> It's a bigger subject than most people realize. There are so many varieties of dead wood. There are so many processes involved in creating dead wood. Uh, and I'll try and um, untangle that through the talk. In terms of insects, do you know that we have over 24,000 species of, of insects on the British list? So that's, I think that's several times the number of birds in the world. And at least 2,000 of those are strongly dependent on dead wood. So that's nearly 10% of our insects and invertebrates are associated, well, our insects are associated with dead wood in one form or another. And these are what we call saprozylic species. And that list includes about 750 sorts of fly, 700 sorts of beetle, and then various representatives of other groups, moths, bugs, bees, wasps, ants, 
and even none insects, such as certain spiders and um, pseudoscorpions and such like. And we keep finding new ones. And we know as of January that at least 320 of these saprozygic insects are flower visitors, i.e. pollinators. OK, so what is a saprozygic insect or a saprozygic invertebrate? So it's defined as one that, is, that develops in association with dead wood or an associated resource. And that associated resource might be fungi. But to give you a list of the sort of things I mean, it could be a dead tree, it could be a tree stump, a log pile, a detached limb that's fallen on the ground, any dead wood attached to a living tree, uh, heart rot, dead branches attached to trees, dead underground roots, and the wounds such as sap runs and rot holes. And the definition of saprozylic, it also covers species developing in the fungi associated with living trees or, or, or dead wood. Uh, and that's not always easy to spot because sometimes the fungi fruiting bodies come out of the ground. You don't, you don't realize they're actually feeding on an underground root or something. Um, but yeah, those, those uh, so dead wood is very important for a, a very, very large fauna. It's not a very sharply defined uh, fauna um, assemblage because some species are facult can use dead wood facultatively. Uh, if you think about the bees that use bee hotels or the wasps that use bee hotels, most of those can use dead wood, but they, they can basically, they can use any wood woodwork with holes in. And sometimes they'll even use a cliff face, um, but others are very, very specialized. Um, so we know there's at least 2000 species of saprozygic insects in the um, UK. And that's from a report that Keith Alexander did. And we know that many are very rare and many, and many are very restricted. And some are absolutely spectacular, like that rose chafer in the middle there. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? You can't miss that. OK, another thing to stress is that Britain has a very, very high proportion of the old trees of Western Europe. It's actually quite hard to find veteran trees uh, on the adjacent continent because the, the, the land use history is different. Once you get into Eastern Europe, you pick up lots of old trees. But in Western Europe, it's quite hard to find old ones. And uh, in fact, some of the biggest concentrations of those old trees are also in Britain. So places like Windsor Forest and Windsor Great Park, I believe that is the biggest concentration of veteran trees in Western Europe. So that's all to do with uh, our particular land use history. Um, you know, we have a lot of things like uh, historic deer parks, particularly where I live in Warwickshire around Kenilworth, um, lots, you know, several dozen um, old deer parks and, and, and partially woodland areas, um, not necessarily surviving, but historically, um, around the Kenilworth and Warwick area. And uh, of course, we also have um, some very old hedge landscapes. Um, Warwickshire is divided into, into what's called planned and ancient countryside. I think, I think your Charmwood area is your ancient countryside, but in Warwickshire, it's like a 50-50 split. And in Kenilworth, I'm just in the, uh, in the ancient countryside, so I've got the sunken lanes, but also you pick up some very old trees in the old hedges there, because the hedges often have a medieval origin you know, along the sunken lanes. And uh, yeah, so, so there's quite a, quite a concentration of trees in ancient landscape. And that's Chalcot Park there in Warwickshire, which is a lovely example of a deer park, still with deer owned by the National Trust. And it's worth saying that within those landscapes, you can pick up some absolutely amazing ancient trees, not just veteran trees, but ancient trees, um, some of which predate the Norman invasion uh, and, and provide links to an Anglo-Saxon period, in some cases even pre-Roman. If you think of some of the very oldest yew trees or some of the really old small leaf lime coppice stalls at places like Western Burt, these probably predate the, uh, the arrival of the Romans. It's quite quite amazing. And look at that picture there, which is the one that Alan used on the advert. The Queen Elizabeth I Cecil Oak in Sussex with me. I'm not a dwarf. <laughs> I'm five foot six. That is a big, big tree. 13 meter girth. And it's funny because on the interpretation, it says this tree is a thousand years old. Well, actually, the tree on the right at Windsor, that's about a thousand years old. <clears throat> and I reckon that tree at Cowdery Park is a lot older than a thousand years old. But remember, as a tree gets that old, it puts on very, very little extra girth per year. So, you know, the difference between a tree that's a thousand years old and a tree that's 1500 years old isn't going to be great in girth terms, but the morphology is very different between those trees. And that is a, that is a really old sessile oak on the left there. Okay, 
can't see the, the titles of any of my slides, so I'm gonna have to guess them. Um, right, so I think this is the dead tree, the dead wood associated with living trees. So it's worth stressing that a lot of the dead wood, a lot of the saprozylic habitats are associated with living trees, not with dead trees, but with living trees. And really a tree can start to produce wounds and small bits of dead wood from quite a young age. It might be from strimmer damage or a bit of damage to a limb. You can get little bits of rock coming in really from a few decades. But the older a tree gets, the more typically, the, the greater the variety and the importance of the dead wood and the dead wood habitats it, 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 it carries. And that's really because, uh, you know, old trees tend to have more wounds, more damage. They tend to have larger cavities. They tend to have much bigger dead limbs. They have a lot more heart rot. And uh, of course, a lot of people think, oh, those trees are dying. But they're not. It's just a natural process of aging. It's like my bald head, my silver beard. That's all it is. I'm not dying. <laughs> I hope I'm not. Um, I suppose the other thing to stress is that when you have an old tree that's several centuries old, it provides a historic ecological link to earlier periods, whether that be medieval, Anglo-Saxon, or even pre-Roman. And the way I like to describe this way of thinking about things, think about a relay race with baton swapping. Really, you know, each veteran tree and each ancient tree holds a precious cargo of rare insects and fungi. And you want that baton of that precious cargo to be swapped to the next generation of trees. Um, and if you can imagine a relay race with baton swapping, you basically want that race to go on as long as possible. Ideally, you want lots of trees so that you've not just got one relay race at a site, you've got lots of relay races where lots of trees are passing on the baton to lots of other trees. And that's a really, I think that's the best way of describing the, the sort of conservation imperative of what we're talking about. It's about swapping the baton between one generation of old trees to the next generation. Obviously, as trees start to become, old trees get scarcer in the landscape and, and sites become more isolated, the relay race to baton swapping becomes more difficult. So really the biggest challenge is how do we maximize the number of old trees in the landscape and how do we keep sites connected? And that's, that's really, you know, that's the conservation imperative that's involved in this subject. Okay, some more definitions. So a mature tree, you know, in a sort of silver cultural sense, tends to be one that's got a full healthy canopy. So it's not necessarily that old. And you can see there's an oak there on the uh, on the left in my local park. That's probably only 50 years old, but it's got a pretty good crown. Uh, and that's what most people would call mature. But it's not particularly old. A veteran tree is, you know, a, a, perhaps the, the older, oldest um, sort of one or two percent of the trees might fall into the category of veteran. And that one in the middle, I would, I would describe that as a veteran oak. So it's got a girth of about five meters. It's at least 250 years old. It's lost quite a lot of limbs. It's probably got quite a lot of heart rot. It's probably got rot holes and its shape has changed quite significantly. And then the one on the right, which is at, um, oh, it's in Herefordshire. I've got the name of the park now. Um, Croft Castle, that's it, Croft Castle. That is what we would call an ancient tree. That's an ancient oak. And you can see it, it, it's exceptionally old. It would be a fraction of a percent of all the oaks that are growing in Herefordshire or in Britain. And you can see the morphology has really changed out of all recognition from the picture on the on the left. It's really old. It's, that one's probably seven, eight hundred years old, at least, maybe even older. It's probably an old um, pollard as well. But look at the, look at the, look at the morphology of it. It's an astonishing tree. And there's a mantra, a saying that an oak spends 300 years growing, 300 years resting, 300 years declining gracefully. That's in the perfect world doesn't always work out like that because they can get disease um, and all sorts of things that can shorten their life. And it's worth saying that coppicing and pollarding can greatly extend the life of a tree, in fact, particularly um, uh, coppicing. You know, your tree could go on indefinitely by being coppiced, but the coppice stool gets bigger and bigger to the point in the end where you can barely tell, is it one coppice stool or several? Um, but yeah. And that's a nice picture. That's from a really good book that you can get online. It's a book produced by Helen Reed for, for English Nature. Um, I thought the title was on it, but it's disappeared there. But anyway, um, it doesn't matter because it's been replaced by another book, but it's a, it's a lovely diagram. And again, it's showing all those features that scare the life out of an arboriculturist, but really excite an entomologist or a, or a naturalist generally, because you know, it's not just insects, but you think of all the, the birds that might be nesting in the, in the cavities, little owls, big owls, 
<laughs> uh, parakeets in London. <laughs> but yeah, you can see how complicated a veteran tree is in terms of all the features it produces. Okay, so here we go. So some, some of the important features on a living tree. So dead attached limbs, what we call staghorned trees. There's a nice picture on the uh, top right there. The heart rot and the internal wood mold on the picture on the bottom left. And that's a red, uh, red rotted, um, I think it's either, I think it's an oak, it's in Windsor, that's red rot. But the, the type of fungus that's growing within the tree can affect the type of rot it gets. You can get white rot or red rot. And also where the location of where a tree is growing, is it in a dry place, is it in a damp place? They can all, they, these can all affect the fungal decay process, which in turn affects the, um, and influences the insects and invertebrates that are present. And then um, it's also worth saying that, that off, it's not just what goes on above the ground, you can have underground roots that are decaying and there's a lot of life in underground roots. In fact, the, the, the stag beetle, uh, the stag beetle develops in underground roots of, of quite young trees, funny enough. People often think the stag beetle needs the biggest, oldest trees. It doesn't. It needs uh, decaying roots of often quite young garden trees. Then you get the, the sort of cavities and rot holes of trees. Uh, that beach in the middle there, that's at White and Wood in Oxfordshire, and you can see its development. The beach is particularly good at producing water filled cavities and rot holes, and you can see how the loss of a limb has resulted in a cavity, and you can get some very special insects developing in those cavities. Sap runs, that tree, that trunk three in from the what's well, sort of in the middle there, it's got you can see it's got a slightly shiny bark, and that's an, that's an apple tree, a domestic apple tree that was growing in Fursey Gardens in the New Forest. I think it's gone now, but it had a really good hissing, smelly sap run, really aromatic sap run, and it attracted all sorts of insects, some just feeding on the sugary liquid, others actually breathing in it. And uh, a lot of entomologists used to visit that yearly and then study what was on it. And then you get all the fungi, the bracket fungi, or the fungi coming out of dead roots. And then, of course, things like old nests, woodpecker holes, squirrel drays, bat roosts. These are all habitats for particular insects. You know, there are certain flies that specialize in bat roosts. So, you know, there's, a, there's, there's almost an insect for every situation. It's quite, quite remarkable. OK, other forms of dead wood. You can get dead standing trees and tree stumps. You can get dead fallen branches. You can get uh, the one in the middle there is a tree with an exposed root plate. And even the root plate is important because uh, you can get a lot of ground nesting bees and wasps. If, if the ground is a bit moist at ground level, they can use the, the mud on a root plate for nesting. So a lot of digger wasps and mining bees, if they, you know, if they can't get hold of really nice, um, well-drained soil on the ground, they can use uh, root plates. The so root plates are quite important. Um, and yeah, e e branches lying on the ground and particularly branches lying in water, in streams and in the edges of rivers. Those, again, are really, really important. They have their own specialised species. Yeah. So basically, there's, there's, there's insects for every sort of saprozoic situation. Remarkable, really. OK, so all these niches, they support a boggling number of saprozoic species, some of which are generalists and quite common. Things like the, the Batman hoverfly that you might be familiar with, Mythropa. That's a that's a that's a, a saprozoic species, but it's pretty common. And you can see it in most habitats. Others are much more specialized and restricted and they can they can often appear to be much rarer than apparently suitable habitat. Got two great examples there. We've got, we've got the violet click beetle. Nice photo by Roger Key there. And um, that's only known from three British sites at the moment. The biggest colony is at the top of Breeden Hill in Worcestershire, where it's using old hollow hedgerow ashes with sort of powdery uh, wood mould at the bottom and often bird nests above the wood mould. Um, we don't really know why it's so rare, because even in Warwickshire, I can think of places in Warwickshire where there's quite good concentrations of um, old ashes. And what it might be, actually, is, is it really as rare as it appears? Because now with click beetles, they're actually de developing pheromones. So for things like rusty red click beetle, now they've got the pheromones, they're suddenly realizing these beetles aren't anywhere near as rare as people thought they were. I don't know if they've got a, a pheromone for the violet click beetle, but I bet when they do, they'll find it in Leicestershire and Warwickshire <laughs> and various other places. That daddy long legs, that crane fly in the middle, that's the royal splinter crane fly. And that's only known from Windsor Forest on one site in Slovenia. It really is rare. And I was absolutely amazed to photograph it. I was with Alan Stubbs. Alan Stubbs is the guy in the next picture. He's actually investigating a, 
a beach stub of Windsor where Nofamaya, which is the, the name of it, Nofamaya Elsnine, the, 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 the crane fly, is known to breed. And we were there at Windsor. It was, it was 35 degrees centigrade, one of those incredibly hot days. We were both in a bad mood because we couldn't find the places we wanted to find and it was so hot. And then eventually at about four o'clock in the afternoon, Alan said, Eureka. And he got a, a, one of these very, very rare crane flies. And I got a photo of it. So there you go. I was very excited by that. So now what I'm going to do is to review some of the main insect groups associated with dead wood, starting with hoverflies, which were my first true love in insects. Got into them when I was about 12 and still absolutely passionate about them. So here are some hoverflies associated with water filled rock holes and cavities. And there's a lovely beach at White and Wood, but you'll find beaches like that in Leicestershire as well. There's places in, in I can think of in Warwickshire with beaches that look just like that, full of rock holes. And these, those rock holes, they fill up with several meters of water and they become the breeding site for various wonderful hoverflies. That one, that one on the top left hand corner, I call it the bumblefly, Pacota personata. It's wonderful. And I remember when I first saw it in Warwickshire, I thought, wow, it's in Warwickshire. And then I found it at quite a few sites in Warwickshire. I'm pretty certain it's in Leicestershire as well. It's probably not that rare. You just need to know where to look for it. But yeah, some of these are really spectacular. I'm not going to go through all of them individually. Here's another trench of hoverflies. These are the ones associated with sap runs and sappy wounds. And that tree on the, uh, the tree trunk there, that's got goat moth caterpillars in it. So goat moths are quite unusual because their caterpillars bore through wood rather than eating leaves. And they do it in a very messy, damaging fashion. And it results in quite big sap runs and sappy wounds on the trunk of a, a tree, which can be quite smelly. And sometimes they start to um, um, ferment and, and fizz. Um, and you can get some wonderfully rare things associated with um, sap runs formed by goat moths. Some really amazing hoverflies. And I suspect that the majority, all of those four species of hoverfly are found in Warwickshire. So I bet they're in Leicestershire as well. You, know, you may well find out from my eye. Um, Oh, yes, I've got one inside. Nature Spot, Nature Spot may feature them. I haven't checked them. Okay, then you get the, the hoverflies associated with this sort of a, the, the heart rot of a tree. So you get a beech tree like that, it's still living, but you can see that the actual in, the inside of the trunk, it's, it's all rotting uh, wood mold and it gets wetter as, as, you go, as you go further down, it gets wetter and there'll be dead um, roots attached to that and there'll be sort of like porridge. And those are the special breeding sites for hoverflies like these. And they need bacteria and fungi to help break down the dead wood for them to digest. They're not just doing it on their own. They're, they're working in tandem with fungi and bacteria to be able to develop. And it takes them two or three years to develop. A lot of saprozylic insects take several years to develop because dead wood is not very nutrient rich. And then, yeah, obviously decaying logs, fallen trees, they have their own tranche of species, but it's the ones at the bottom I wanted to focus on here. Partially submerged dead wood. Hey, look, there's a hoverfly called Nigel Jones. Um, actually, Nigel, <laughs> Nigel's a good friend for mine. He uh, of mine. He lives in Shropshire, which is one of the hot spots for a hoverfly called the, the, log, the log jammer hoverfly, Chalca surface unotus, which historically was always regarded as a rare hoverfly of um, sort of like the Welsh borders and Herefordshire, a few sites in Dorset. Um, so Nigel got to know it quite well in his part of the world. Then I started to turn it up in Warwickshire, particularly stream and river courses with grey poplars, because the grey poplars tend to, they grow very quickly, they fall down after about 100 years, and you can often find a lot of fresh dead wood within streams from grey poplar and that proved to be the habitat that the, um, the log jammer hoverfly likes in Warwickshire. I bet you it's in Leicestershire. I don't know if you've recorded it yet but I imagine it's there and the place you need to look is the quietest little rural wooded streams. So really pretty ones off the beaten track where you know old willows, old alders, old poplars might be falling into a stream. That's where to look for it. It doesn't feed on flowers so you have to look on Nettle, nettle leaves and bits of dead wood alongside the, the stream course, but I bet you it's in Leicestershire. Okay, and it's worth saying that whilst a lot of these saprozylic insects are not particularly specific to a, a species of tree, there are some um, specialists, there are some aspen specialists. So at the top there, we've got on the left, one that's called Xylotatada, and that's quite a widespread um, species of aspen, quite widespread in Warwickshire. Um, I imagine if you've got any decent aspen rich woods in Leicestershire, you'll find it there. And it breeds in small scale wounds and bits of dead wood 
um, on aspen, often the bases of trunks and such like, probably the, 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 the freshly fallen wood as well. So that's quite widespread. But in the middle there, that chestnut looking thing, that's the aspen hoverfly, Hammerschmittia ferruginea, what a name. And that's a real specialist of the Scottish Highlands, only found at a handful of sites. And it's interesting because I think Aspen arrived in Britain in two waves. I think there was a, a, a primary wave after the last ice age. And, and the fauna that came in with that is now found in Scotland. And then there was another wave of Aspen that came in and it's got a slightly different assemblage of insects, some of which aren't in the Scottish Aspen woods and, and ditto some of the Scottish ones aren't in the Southern woods. So the insects are kind of reflecting the fact that Aspen appears to have come in in two different waves I don't know if there's any genetic difference between the aspen, but it's interesting. But yeah, that, that, that Hammerschmittia in the middle, it needs aspen woods with several hundred mature trees. It needs a constant input for fresh fallen trunks because it develops under the bark of the fresh fallen trunks. And then below it, we've got some pine specialists. The one on the left is called uh, Blerophallax, the pine hoverfly. And that's only really known from about three sites in the highlands. It used to be more widespread, but it's declined. And, and then the one in the middle is called Calistra rufa. They both breed in waterfield cavities of old pines or pine stumps. And it's interesting because whilst Blera is very, very rare and needing a lot of help from um, Nature Scots and various other organisations up in, in the Cairngorms, Calistra rufa has done something absolutely bizarre over the last 10 years. It started turning up in southern England. It turned up first in Shropshire on the Rekin, then it turned up in Hertfordshire, then it turned up in Norfolk. That photo there is the very first Welsh record from South Wales. And we don't know whether it's coming from the continent or whether it's coming from the north, but it can now, as well as using Scots pine, it can now use Corsican pine. And that seems to have opened up a new opportunity for it. So maybe one day it'll be really common. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a wonderful little creature, very pretty. Okay, other flies, look at those crane flies, gosh. In fact, that one on the green leaf is quite widespread. That, that's, you know, I get that flying in my house in Kenilworth. I, I think that's quite widespread in Leicestershire. Um, but yeah, some of these crane flies are absolutely amazing. So they breed in dead wood. Um, they may even visit, I think they visit flowers at night, someone said once. Uh, the wood soldier fly, I don't think that's in Warwickshire or Leicestershire yet. That stilt-legged fly is really only at Windsor and the New Forest, or Windsor, I think, actually. That snipe fly in the middle, that's one that's coming our way. It's certainly been found at um, Sandy in Bedfordshire. And I think, I think that's, I wouldn't be surprised if that's not already in our area. That snipe fly called Chrysopilus litus. And again, it's developing in these very old hollow trees. That robber fly there, you won't find, I don't think you'll find that in our part of the world. It's another, that's another pine wood speciality of Scotland called the, um, the bumblebee robber fly. And it, it's larvae are predators of the larvae of longhorn beetles in fallen Scots pine trunks. So it's a classic thing of, uh, of, of um, Caledonian pine woodland. And when it flies, you'd never believe it. When it flies, it really does look like a bumblebee. When it lands, it doesn't look like a bumblebee, but when it flies, it certainly does. In fact, it looks like the bilberry bumblebee, really good mimic. Okay, but the thing to stress is that the majority of the flies associated with dead wood are quite small and inconspicuous. And a lot of people notice them, but once you learn them, they're telling you an awful lot. They're helping you to understand the deadwood habitat, all the individual microhabitats. Um, you know, they, they just give you a quite a, a complex and sophisticated way of looking at, at deadwood as a habitat, which is very useful. Moving on to beetles, so the iconic groups of saprozylic beetles. All three of our stag beetles are saprozylic, and um, there's all three of them there. Um, I imagine they've all been recorded from Leicestershire. They've all been recorded from Warwickshire. Uh, quite a high proportion of our chafers develop in deadwood. That green one, that's the noble chafer. That's quite interesting because it relies very heavily on old orchards in places like Worcestershire and Herefordshire and South Gloucestershire. Uh, that, that's its main habitat in Britain. It will, will use different habitats else in the New Forest, but for the most part, it's reliant on very old orchards. So it's become like a flagship species for old orchards in the west of England. And then we've got that wonderful bee chafer. Now that, that bee chafer, that's our native one, Tritius fasciatus, which is in the north and western Britain using birch stumps. But there's a new bee chafer, Tritius gallicus, which has arrived in southeast England. And it's already been recorded in Nottinghamshire. And I don't know if it's been found in Leicestershire yet, but it's coming our way. So look at it. it looks, if you see a bleach bee chafer, like that one on the top um, right, 
it'll probably be Tritius Gallicus. So yeah, it, you'll probably find it just sitting on a hogweed or something. You keep your eyes open. And then we get these wonderful click beetles. Not all click beetles are saprozylic, but a fair proportion are. Notably those gorgeous red and black Ampedus click beetles on the, the lower right there, really pretty things. Okay. Longhorn beetles, yeah, fairly high proportion of longhorn beetles are saprozylic. Often they, um, they develop just under the bark when they're young, the larvae, and then the larvae burrow much deeper as they grow over the two to three years. But uh, yeah, some of those are quite spectacular. And they include the, the, the wasp beetle at the bottom there, that gorgeous wasp beetle, which is quite common. Some of you may be familiar with the two cardinal beetles, the bright red cardinal beetles. They're, they're not too rare. And they just like uh, fallen logs, fallen trunks in shady places. Often if you if you lift the, uh, the bark, you find lots of larvae of cardinal beetles. That giant weevil, that's a, it's a really spectacular thing. It's oh, must be about one and a half centimeters, yeah, nearly two centimeters long, one and a half centimeters long, uh, platyrhinus uh, arbosus. That's associated with the fungi on ash trees. So if you find a fallen ash trunk, look for the weevil, but it's very well camouflaged. So yeah, you get all these, but again, the majority of the beetles associated with dead wood are very small, um, you wouldn't necessarily notice them, but they tell you an awful lot about the habitat, about the type of rot, perhaps the type of um, location and such like. Um, quite a few bees and wasps associated with dead wood, things like leaf cutter bees and mason bees, they'll, they will nest in the old beetle holes on, on very dry sun-baked dead wood. They'll also use bee hotels because really they just want tunnels. They just want they just want pre-existing pre tunnels or very soft dead wood that they can burrow into. So things like yeah, mason bees, leaf cutter bees. There's a bumblebee there, and that is the tree bumblebee because the tree bumblebee, which has only been in Britain for about 20 years, it, it always it nearly always nests above the ground, and probably its favourite habitat for nesting is natural cavities in trees. Or well, they will use roof spaces as well, and bird boxes. And then we've got various hunting wasps. So often if you find a nice old dead tree stump in the sun, you know, as opposed to the shade, because they do need sort of quite hot, sunny places, you'll often find lots of these hunting wasps buzzing around, bringing in flies and aphids to put in their nest cells. And then we've got the horntail there, which is a, a horntail, so a type of giant sawfly that it, drill, it drills its eggs into the wood. And it the funny thing about the horntail, it doesn't just drill it's eggs into the wood, but it introduces a fungus with the eggs. And that fungus is necessary for the larvae to, to develop. Now the horn cell, that horn cell there, mostly develops in conifer wood. And some of the foreign horn cells, or wood wasps as they're called, they can be a real pest. They can really damage um, uh, pine uh, uh, um, conifer crops. They can do a lot of damage to the trees. Our, the, our native one doesn't do that, but some of, the, some of the black shiny ones that occasionally turn up in Britain a really serious forest pest because their fungi can really kill, quickly kill a, a, a plantation of conifers. And often you don't see the horn tail, but you actually see it's ichneumon wasp, that black and white spotted thing with red legs, Rissipusiosauria, Britain's biggest ichneumon wasp. That's often the giveaway that you've got horn tails in your area. I tend to see the ichneumon much more than I see the horn tail. Uh, ants, which are obviously just specialized wasps, so I'll put them in this page. Ants also like dead wood. Certain species are specialized in nesting in dead wood. And then things like hornets. I mean, hornets love old trees to nest in. And of course, they also do a lot of their foraging from the canopies of old trees. There you go. So there's a nice picture. That's a, what we call a hulk uh, or, a, or a big stump of a, a dead beech at White and Wood. And if you, if you go there when, in some summer when the sun's out, it's absolutely teeming with digger wasps and leaf cutter bees and such like. And then all of their cuckoos and parasites, things like ruby tailed wasps, dark bees, satellite flies, all these things that are, that are nesting, um, developing in the nests of, um, of bees and wasps. <coughs> so it can be quite a big assemblage. That, that stump there, we've studied that for many years, and that has produced several dozen species of insect, you know, maybe 50 or 60 species of insect. Uh, associated with the dead wood, just just you know, sort of the just you know the bees and the wasps and, and the associates there. Other stuff, wood boring moths. I mentioned the goat moth, but also things like the hornet clear wings. They burrow their way through willows or poplars, depending on the species. Wood lice, centipedes, developing the wood mold. Certain spiders, like like the cavities in old trees, even cave spiders. That's a cave spider there with my hand. You can sometimes find cave spiders in the cavities of um, 
old trees. And then there's a couple of pseudoscorpions that are specialists of old trees as well. So it's a big old fauna. So yeah, some key points just to summarize. There's a lot of saprozylic species, over 2,000 in Britain. Some are very rare and endangered. Some are very specialized, but the point is we're still learning about the needs of many of them. And any of you can contribute to learning about these creatures, you know, because we, you know, we, we need more people looking at them. There's very diverse larval life cycles that include xylophagus, which is actually eating the dead wood, saprophagus, which is eating other decaying things, scavenging, that's, you know, um, eating dead, other dead insects within the dead wood, Fungivorous, eating the fungi, predatory, parasitic, flower visiting, nest making, and aquatic, if you're one of those insects that develops in a water filled rot hole. So, all great variety of life cycles. The invertebrates are crucial for the recycling of the dead wood. It's not, not all down to the fungi, it's a sort of partnership between fungi, bacteria, um, invertebrates, and, and various other things that, that, that uh, break down the dead wood. The invertebrates are fantastic barometers for the age and the condition of the site. And I'll come on to that in, in a couple of slides time. And then the thing to stress is that the insects breeding in dead wood often require more than just that to complete a life cycle. So if you're a if you're a hoverfly or a bee nesting in dead wood, you, you, you need your flowers and your blossoms nearby. Or if you're something predatory like a digger wasp, you, you need prey nearby. And I suppose the great thing about that is that it gets you thinking about the habitat in a more sophisticated manner. I, I tend to, I very much look at the countryside as a, as a, as a series of habitat mosaics, um, because really you have to, I mean, it's, an ex, it's, it's not rocket science, you don't have to be particularly academic to think in those terms, but just, you know, pretend you're Google Earth, you're looking down, and within one patch of landscape you can see old trees, you can see blossoms, you can see hogweed patches, um, you know, you might see all sorts of habitats. And I, I like to look at the countryside as, as, a, as, a, as a mosaic of, and a combination of different, different features, because that's often what the life cycles of these creatures need. Okay, I can't see what it says at the top there. But yeah, I, yeah. So I think what I was trying to say at the top there is that yes, invertebrates and insects, they make you look at the world in a different way. And something that the coleopterists have done, so those are the beetle people, is they develop this index of ecological, ecological continuity, which is really interesting. So if you can imagine a coleopterist, he goes to a, a, a nice bit of um, historic parkland or deer park or an ancient wood, and he, and he, he or she starts recording all the, um, uh, the beetles associated with the dead wood, and they end up with a list, and then you can, you can, you can class the beetles in that list, um, three classes, depending on how, how um, loyal they are to veteran trees. And you can develop a score. I'm not going to go into the detail, but there's a lot of stuff online that shows you how to develop a score. And you can then rank the sites. And basically, the best way to describe this, you know, you know, I was describing the relay race and the baton passing. This index of ecological continuity that the, be the beetle people have developed, it almost is a, a way of telling how good is the relay race, how good is the baton passing. Because bear in mind that a lot of these veteran ancient, ancient trees now don't necessarily exist today within lovely deer parks. Often they're in um, the grounds of universities or in business parks or even in the suburbs in a, in a housing estate. And you can often still find really important assemblages of beetles in these weird locations. And what those assemblages are telling you is that once upon a time, that isolated veteran tree may have been developing within a really good deer park. Uh, and, it's, and, that, and that precious cargo is still there how long it will stay there is anybody's business. And there's Keith Alexander. He's uh, the UK's leading expert on saprophytic insects. Okay, so as a, as a result of that uh, index, uh, people have ranked uh, sites uh, for their, their score. Um, the top English sites were obviously places like the New Forest of Windsor, Breeden Hill. Um, Bradgate Park will be there somewhere. It's not in the top 10, I don't think. And I'm sure you've got other Leicestershire sites within that ranking. And you can find out, you can go online. I, I, I can't remember what the website is, but if you put in the right keywords, you can find the website with, um, with the latest ranking, which uh, a chat called Adrian Fowles keeps up to date. So there you go. That's, so it's good because obviously it helps us to understand which sites are most critical, which sites got the biggest number of rare species, which, which ones need the most conservation attention. Okay. So normally when I give this talk, it's within a conservation sort of um, context, you know, maybe for a wildlife trust or 
as part of a, a conservation um, seminar. So, so I'm going to talk a bit about the, the, the conservation aspects. So your management options are, well, firstly, there's, there's none intervention, just let nature take its course. And I think, it, you know, any, any wood with old trees and dead wood, you should, um, you should allow at least some of the site just to develop naturally, just to drop its dead wood and just, you know, for trees to fall apart naturally. You need, it's good to have a bit of that because these are, these are very complex processes. And if you interfere with them too much, you may be um, shortcutting the, uh, the opportunities. So there's, there's a lot to be said for just uh, non-intervention. But there's also a lot to be said for, for intervention and for active management. So it might be that after coppicing, you leave some logs lying around and just let them decay. It may be that you leave log piles for a while from, from um, a felling cycle, if you're not having to sell them. You, for a very old tree that you wanted to go on for another couple of centuries, you, may, you might have to preserve some stilts like they do at Sherwood Park. And this one's actually, this one was actually in Scotland, the Burnham Oak. And then for the very rarest insects, things associated with really old um, hollow beaches, you may even have to create fake hollow trunks and attach them to an existing trunk. And actually, that's that's what they do at Windsor, Windsor Forest. Because some of the some of the species there are so rare, they just have to experiment as much as they can. OK, the other thing to stress, and it doesn't get stressed enough, is it's not just in, it's not just about having lots of dead wood. It's also about making sure there's a constant input of dead wood and not just any dead wood, but really a constant input of a variety of dead wood. Really, if you've got, you know, new aspen falling down, new oak, new ash falling down, you know, number one, just the newness of the dead wood is, is valuable because in the first two or three years after a trunk falls, you get a very specific form of decay under the bark that a lot of insects need. But then, you know, if, if, if you've got different species doing that, that that's, you're going to get a bigger assemblage. But I've got, I've got another picture of that um, aspen hoverfly there because that, that's a really good example of a fly, you know, um, you need, you need an aspen wood with several hundred mature trees. So you've always, every one or two years, you've got one falling over. And then really for the first two or three years after it's fallen over, it's, it's very, very smelly, it smells of balsam. And that's where you get the Hammerschmittia breeding. And there's James Sylvie from the RSPB there. He's just seen his very first Hammerschmittia near Grandtown. He's looking very happy. And they literally were all over that. There were loads of them over that fallen trunk. Very, very exciting. Okay, the other thing is about um, managing the rides and the clearings of woods, making sure they're flowery, making sure there's lots of warm sheltered places, because a lot of things that develop in dead wood, then need to forage in sheltered flowery areas. And if any of you are involved in work parties, uh, you know, get involved with scalloping of rides, there's a bit of scalloping in the snow there going on where not only, not only widening a ride, but doing widening, widening a ride in a very sort of um, in an undulating fashion, which means that on a sunny day in spring and summer, those little sunspots get a lot hotter than the, main, than the middle of the ride. That's quite important. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and so obviously managing coppicing, you get like nice shows of bluebells and uh, violets and lesser celandine, bugle, and uh, these are all important for the foraging of deadwood insects. Okay, uh, as I said, over 300 species of saprozylic insects are flower visitors. So one of the things you have to do is to, is to provide lots of forage for them. Um, I'm always banging on about blossom sequences. Blossom sequences are so important, not just for saprozylic insects, but just, you know, insects in general, you know, and, and you want blossom sequences in your towns, in your cities, in your farmland, in your wetlands. But there, there's a good blossom sequence there. We've got goat willow, we've got blackthorn, we've got some uh, wild cherry, we've got some hawthorn. Um, so that's, every, you know, you may even start off with cherry plum in late February. And it can go until dogwood or elder into June. So at a good site, you might have three months of blossom sequence, you know, crab apple, wild pear, all the things, you know, uh, wayfaring tree, all the things that can contribute to a blossom sequence. But they can be quite important in woods. And also in spring, things like cow parsley and bugle, all those things are really, really valuable. And then come summer, things like bramble, hogweed, thistles, ragworts, wild angelica, scabiouses, by autumn, ivy. And the critical message here is, is not to mow a flowery woodland ride or a grassy glade, or, or if you've got a deer park, not mowing a patch of hogweed or thistles at the flowering peak, because a lot of insects will be using those, including some of your rare saprozylics. You know, some of our rarest um, saprozylic insects actually forage on really common flowers, hogweed and hawthorn and thistles. 
you know, um, just because it's a common flower doesn't mean that something rare isn't needing it. Okay, so the key points here, sorry, it's a bit wordy, but at least when you come to, if you come to look at this um, Zoom talk, this um, YouTube, you, you'll have all these lovely um, informative slides here. So broadleaf ancient woodland should have lots of dead wood. They reckon one to 200 cubic meters per hectare. Dead wood should be as varied in nature and location as possible. Some in the sun, some in the shade, different species of dead wood, different sizes. Dead wood shouldn't be removed unless there's a considered justification. Obviously, if it's, if it's commercial forestry wood, you know, you, 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 it's, a it's, a, it's a crop. But even so, can you, can you retain some of the dead wood? Do you have to remove all of it? Veteran trees should be conserved and site management should aim to maintain, if not increase, the number of such trees. Basically, it's the old baton passing, the old relay race principle. You want, you want a good bit of baton passing, a, bit, a good relay race at your site, a lot of passing of precious parcels of rare invertebrates from one generation of trees to the next. At some sites where things are quite critical, you've got some really rare stuff, there may be a case of veteranization of mature trees. They even do that sometimes with dynamite, not to kill a tree, but just to try and create a particular wound. And I think they even inoculate trees to try and get certain fungi into certain trees to create a, a particular form of lock of rot. Tree species can matter. Um, and you should be careful when you're doing woodland management or, or management of any sort of habitat. You know, don't remove all your aspen in one go. Don't remove all your cherries in one go. It's very easily done because often these trees aren't evenly distributed at a site. They can often be quite clumped in their distribution. And it can be very easy when you're doing a bit of woodland management, get rid of all your aspen in one go. And if, if there's no other aspen nearby, you'll have lost your aspen fauna and it probably won't ever come back again. As I say, none intervention can be valuable, but sometimes you also need management, such as rides and clearings. Uh, sometimes you have to put your log piles in particular places so that you, you create the variety of conditions. Grazing, obviously in, a, in, a, in pasture woodland, grazing is a historical element, but within other types of situations, grazing can be quite damaging in, in that it can, it can remove um, the humid sheltered field layer, it can eliminate flowers. And actually something I saw at Windsor Forest is the muntjac are basically killing all the young beech trees. So they're not gonna have, you know, if they don't do something about the muntjac at Windsor Forest, they're not gonna have mature veteran beech trees in 200 years time, because the muntjac would have killed everything. Okay. And then, yeah, the other thing to stress is, you know, it's, it's always important to keep monitoring and, uh, you know, surveying the, the saprozylic assemblages. And yes, yeah, sometimes you can do it as a hardened entomologist, but you can also do it through your camera just by taking pictures and sending your pictures to um, Nature Spot. Sometimes you may find an important record without meaning to. Okay. In terms of further reading matter, there's quite a lot out there. Um, yep, I've, I'm not gonna, because this is gonna be a slide, you can you can check it out afterwards, but there's there's a lot of stuff out there from Ancient Tree Form, wood, Wooden Trust, Bug Life, RSPB, there's lots of stuff out there, and stuff on my research gate account. In terms of identifying saprozylic insects, it's a lot easier now because a lot of us have, uh, have taken our, um, our, put our efforts online and I'm going to start off with my efforts. So if you go onto my Flickr site, so the thing to do is you put in Stephen Falk Flickr collections. The collections is vital. If you don't put in Stephen, you don't put collections into a search on Google, you'll just get my photo stream, which is no good. But if you put collections, you get to a hierarchical encyclopedia of um, insects and other wildlife and you just keep drilling down and you go through the orders through the families through the genera to the species and then you can you get a drop down species account for lots of things and you get photos if you keep clicking on those photos which are often photos of living and pinned specimens and the critical parts of the body it's quite it's, it's like a virtual museum collection very very carefully put together if you keep clicking on those pictures they get bigger and bigger it's quite remarkable so that's one resource out there another one which i couldn't but mention is nature spot which is your efforts i use this an awful lot and if you do a google search often for a species the first the, the biggest the one that comes up first is the nature spot species account and that tells you that it's being used not, not, not just by Leicestershire uh, naturalists, it's being used by people all over Britain. Because if it wasn't that popular, it wouldn't come out at the top. So it's very, very popular. It's, it's regarded as a naturally important resource, even though it, it covers Leicestershire and Rutland. Because this sort of stuff is just invaluable, you know. And believe me, I use it as much as you guys. 
The other good one is the Nottinghamshire ecreenbirds.com. They call it ecreen birds, but it covers loads and loads of wildlife groups. It's really good for beetles and stuff like that. So again, you just, just put those into Google. And there's some, there's loads and loads of fabulous books. My friend Paul Brock um, keeps producing these wonderful insect guides. He's always got new ones on the go. Uh, he's good. I will stay with him in, when I'm in the new forest. And uh, yeah, his, his books are absolutely fantastic. His comprehensive guide of insects. You've got things like my bee field guide. In fact, the whole of that British Wildlife Field Guide series is really great. And of course, there's also Pisces and there's some um, of oh, the other company, um, da, 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 da. Wild Guides. So, Wild Guides, Pisces, British Wildlife Bloomsbury Publishing, producing some amazing guides out there. And then you've got sort of private ventures like Andrew Duff's Beetles of Britain and Ireland. That's a three volume set, absolutely brilliant for beetles. You know, for some beetle groups, it's the only up-to-date coverage of them. Okay, so there you go. My goodness, I'm still awake. That's a good sign. <laughs> if I fall asleep in one of my talks, I know I've overcooked it. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm hoping this talk will spur you on to look more closely at uh, the Deadwood and the old trees of Leicestershire and get you to contribute your records, uh, uh, primarily to Nature's Spot. You can do it to iRecord, but I presume if it goes to Nature Spot, it goes then to iRecord. But believe me, you don't have to be an expert to make a contribution. Some of the biggest contributions are through what I call beginner's luck. Beginner's luck, where someone photographs something they don't quite recognize, and then suddenly, in fact, I had this experience. I can't tell you the details. I photographed something this summer. It's something that hadn't been seen in Britain for 80 years. Sent the picture to the expert. He started swearing down the phone, and we suddenly realized oh boy, we've found something really important. I'm hoping it'll be a press release at some point soon, but I can't give you any details yet. So anyway, that's me. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Stephen. Uh, thanks very much. If you want to turn your file sharing off now. Right. Oh yeah, stop sharing. There we go. Now we can see you again. Thanks very much. And um, th thanks very much for the plugs for uh, Nature Spot. Um, I should just say, uh, for the benefit of, of YouTube, um, uh, if you're in Leicestershire and Rutland, we, we, we would like your records via Nature Spot. Now, then go into the county archive as well as all the relevant national recording schemes. Uh, but if you're elsewhere in the UK, uh, uh, if you go into iRecord directly, uh, and then uh, all, all the recording schemes will pick up your, your records. So thanks very much for that. So we've got one question. I think you're happy to take some, some questions. Um, uh, so, so Kate's got a, a dead poplar tree at the end of her garden, and uh, she wants to know if there's anything specific she should be looking for, uh, I guess, particularly at this time of year. Got any suggestions? Yeah, this time of year things have slowed down a little bit, um, but 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 certainly poplar, dead poplars are very good for all sorts of things. Um, I think really the thing, oh, I think unless you start pulling it apart, and that can be quite controversial because you don't want to, you know, it's one it's one of the big issues in places like the New Forest and Windsor where um, certain coleopters will literally pull apart a bit of dead wood to find the rare beetles that they want to put in their collection. I'd, I'd say the best thing to do is get ready, get prepared and get ready for spring and particularly summer and then see what's what's on it there but there's a there's somebody she's called judy webb she's based near oxford judy and judy has been studying some suburban poplars uh, in her patch of um, oxfordshire and she's found all sorts of rare things on poplars so the potential is very high um and of course the fauna will change as as as, as the tree ages and decays different things will come and go. If it's in the sun, you may get some wonderful um, um, sort of digger wasps and hunting wasps and all their, all their you know, ruby-tailed wasp cuckoos and all sorts of other things associated with it. I think the thing to do is just observe it and take lots of photos. That's great. So we're um, uh, happy to uh, take any more questions anybody wants, either verbally or... Um, can I, if, while, while people are thinking of questions, can I just ask you one? Um, the, 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 the thing that annoys me second most when I'm walking around woodland, the thing that annoys me most being plastic tree guards left, left unattended for decades, uh, but the thing that annoys me second most is, is the, the, obviously the lack of dead wood. 
And, and I, I frequently visit one of these millennium woods and, and walk around and think, well, this will probably be quite nice in a thousand years time, uh, which I guess is why it's called the millennium wood. Um, but um, what, what do you think of these, these efforts to artificially age trees, to create lightning strikes with chainsaws and things like that? If, if you're doing it to a relatively young tree, is, is it likely to be terribly effective? Won't the heartwood be too, too strong to be really much use to uh, many of these insects? I'd say if you're doing it to a young tree, yes, you're probably right. And, and I, I don't know if much has been um, published on, on the actual you know, um, effectiveness of it. Uh, but I think, they, I think it's been done as a last resort at places like Windsor and some of the other, other big um, historic parts where they, where they can see there's a, a gap in the generation, where, where they can see the relay race is going to stop. Mm. They can see that someone's going to drop that blooming baton, someone's going to drop that baton, and that precious cargo of rare insects is going to get lost. And um, yeah, that, that, that's where they, people often think, right, we better intervene here because we can see there's a 200-year age gap and we need to somehow bridge that 200-year age gap. Um, yeah, so it, it has its place, but I don't, think, I don't know how effective it is. And you certainly wouldn't want to do it too often. It's far better to work with nature, um, you know, I, yeah. But I, I, I'm not an expert. I, I would say the ancient mm -hmm. tree, the ancient tree forum, will know a lot more about this. They're the real experts mm -hmm. in this subject matter. Yeah. There's a comment from uh, Kate about uh, foraging in in general. Um, certainly, I think foraging for fungi is becoming a, an increasing problem. Uh, as, as a people just generally killing or kicking over every fungus they see in case their dog eats it. Um, but um, Kate said foraging for firewood uh, is is a problem at uh, at some sites. Mm. Um, that which which sort of raises another topic. If we have a lot of uh, dead wood um, around, and given some of the heat waves that we can expect over the next few decades, um, what would you say about? Uh, fire and fire risk in in woodlands. I mean, fortunately, we've been spared the fires that we've seen in 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 places like California and Australia, but that risk is going to grow considerably. And presumably, people who manage these sites, are, being aware of that, may not be too tempted to leave too much dead wood and, and undergrowth around. Yeah, I mean, that's it's more of an issue in coniferous plantations, which are which are less critical for saprozyloic insects. I think in a broadleaf setting, it's not a big issue. Um, broadleaf woods don't tend to burn in the same way that coniferous woods do because they don't have the resin. So I don't think it's too big an issue in Britain, mainly mainly because it's the coniferous plantations that, that we're nervous about. It, it is potentially an issue in the Caledonian pine woods. And I must admit, the last time I was in the Caledonian pine woodlands, um, I was there helping with the um, Aspen hoverfly uh, project and it was quite shocking because I was there the first week of June it was 28 degrees centigrade mm -hmm. and basically it, it felt you know there was no all the boggy pools had dried up and that really and of course there's bracken everywhere and dry heather that felt that felt very very um, hazardous it really felt like one person could burn several square miles of Caledonian pine forest if they were minded yeah yeah it's a little bit worrying yeah it is. Oh, it Richard is Glassboro. Yeah, I know Richard. <laughs> so, yeah, question from Richard. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, you could see Richard's question. Is the difference okay. in the importance of deadwood in woodlands, open sites, and deliberate deadwood created in gardens? It can all be valued. It can all be valuable. It can, if deadwood in gardens can have wonderful assemblages of basically deadwood in a garden can act like a super bee hotel. You can end up with all sorts of things, particularly drill holes in it. And in fact, I, that's what I've done in my garden. I've, got, I've, got old, I've managed to get hold of some old, um, uh, old post, wooden posts that someone was going to get rid of. And I, I put them in my garden. I sort of buried, I buried one end about a foot into the, into the ground. And then I just drilled millions and millions of holes. I used every drill bit to drill as many holes as possible. And now I've got all sorts of insects nesting in those holes. And you can do that with a, you know, if, if you want, you can use an old tree, tree, tree trunk. Or a bit of you know, sort of an old tree, um, a large bit of dead wood, and you can you can you can use it as, as a landscape feature. But yeah, it can it can be just as good in a garden as, as a. In fact, gardens were very flowery. So that's the great thing with a with a garden, you've got that assured combination of dead wood and flowers and blossoms. Yeah. So yeah, so quite, any, quite any a lot area. of 
quite a lot of people do have log piles, uh, small log piles in, in their gardens. Um, uh, is it is it worth uh, taking the drill to when you if you're making a log pile, uh, drill some holes in the logs? Yeah, not so much a log pile. Um, I, I would say if you've got if you've got some dead wood, I would say if you've got some dead wood, sort of um, um, how can I put? It's got to be yeah, it's got to be in the sun. It's got to be in the shelter. A lot of log piles are often in quite shady areas. If it's in shady areas, don't bother. But if it's a log pile actually in a sort of very open, sheltered, sunny bit of the garden, yes, it might well be worth doing it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's a, there's a turning to your, one of your other interests. There's a question about tree diseases. Um, uh, it, it, are, are, are all of these tree diseases thinking about sudden oak death and ash dieback and, and all of these other things that are sweeping up towards us? Um, it, are they good news for the groups of insects you've been talking about or bad news? In the short term, they can be good news and that they, you suddenly find there's lots of dead wood. In the long term, it's disastrous because the, the relay race and the baton, the baton passing breaks down. Your relay race comes to a sudden halt. You end up with basically if it's a, if it's four times 100 meters, you have an amazing first 100 meters and then it all goes completely belly up. <laughs> so, yes. so no, they're, they're bad. They're bad news because you yeah, you don't want you don't really don't want disease intervening with the, um, the, the sort of continuity of, of habitat conditions, which is what happens. It, it's the speed of change, isn't it? You know, three, yes. three, as you as you said, three hundred years growing, three hundred years living, and three hundred years dying is what we're aiming for, really. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and lots of it at one site. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, so um, what I'll do at this point is just ask Hazel uh, if you want to just unmute yourself, Hazel, and just 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 round off the recording for us, please. Right, thank you, Alan. Um, first of all, I'd really like to say um, enormous thanks to you, Stephen. It's been absolutely fantastic talk. So interesting, so full of all sorts of things, fabulous pictures. I love your enthusiasm. Um, I suppose I, what I'd really most like to say is that the information you've given us all tonight, um, I... I I like the fact that you are spreading this information around to lots of people, because I do feel that people who are in charge of planning and so on should be aware of the importance of old trees. I mean, for instance, like the HS2 route, um, people are quite happy to plough through triple SIs, ancient woodlands, and it's okay because we'll plant some trees somewhere else. And the sort of information that you are spreading around is so important for people to understand that um, you can't just plant trees everywhere, somewhere else, that um, uh, a 20 year old oak tree is not going to provide the same habitat as a, a thousand year old oak tree. And that does seem to be missing. And I so appreciate the fact that you are spreading this word around of the importance of dead wood. So I think on behalf of everybody in our um, society, I, I wish to say thank you very much for such an important talk as I see it, um, which I'm sure everybody's enjoyed. I can see lots of faces and they're sitting glued to their screens. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Over to you, Alan.